underwear multiple choice. So I've tried to include uh, Kaz shots as I find them appropriate. All right, period of the function, just two pi on n, ends up with 12. The range of the function, quick graph sketch. Okay, so I've got the graph of x squared minus one. Re domain restriction, so make sure you sketch it. And you see down there that the minimum value is at, um, what's the range, negative one. And up here we have the point negative two, three. Um, again, you could quite possibly, uh, again, let's identify the transformations that have taken place. Three affects the Y, X plus one is a translation of one unit left, minus two we subtract. And then if I substitute the point one, two in, I'll get the point zero, four. All right. um, the function F of G of X, F of G of X. So. I guess the trick with this one in here is that's g of x minus 1 is equal to x. So I've got to do a little bit of intuitive. That's x minus. If I work out g of x plus 1, sorry, if I substitute, let's just change that color again. Let's leave it as g. But let's put x plus 1 in for x, yeah, that'll give me the square root of x plus 1. And then on the left-hand side, I very soon end up with g of x. It doesn't matter colors. So g of x minus 1 is equal to root x, which implies g of x plus 1 is equal to, uh, sorry, g of x is equal to the square root of x plus 1. So that's the function I'm substituting into f of x. Um, so then f of g of x is 3 times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. All right, so that's just reading the question carefully, because you can see how uh, very easily a lot of people will pick C. Question five, I thought easiest way is just to find it on the function and just check each of the options. If I'd find f of x is equal to x minus one and then check to see if f of x plus one equals f of x minus one, it doesn't. Pick the second function, x plus one, define and check to see if it works. If I come down to one minus x, I soon see that if f of x plus one does equal f of x minus one. All right, so D is the answer. They've got the same scale. The graph has been transformed onto the could be. So what's the transformation that's occurred? So we can see there's been a reflection about the y-axis. So um, that's negative x, isn't it? And then the y value, the asymptote there is moved down twice as far. See, it hasn't shifted down one unit because my intercept hasn't changed. That's so a dilation factor. So dilate by two from x. And you can see I've written it down there. You give me um, negative x to y, which there's a typo there of some sort. Um, isn't there. So that makes it a bit tick tricky. All right. the period and range respectively. So again, two pi on N, and just be really careful with your two pi on N here. Two pi on four pi on three. You can read it so many ways, depending on how your brackets, and your CAS will work it out. If you just type that in without brackets, you're not gonna get the right answer. Your calculator will go two pi on four watt pi, um, which will give you a half divided by three, which is a six. That's what the CAS will give you. So that's wrong bracketed that way. It's that, isn't it? So flip it upside down and multiply. So two pi times three over four pi. Six on four, which is three on two. So there's my period. So it's that, that possibilities. Range, well, we know the graph is normally from negative two to two. 
we subtract one, negative three to one. So A is the correct response. Part of the polynomial function is shown below. A possible rule for this function. So you can see I've listed the possible factors. Now it's a negative quartic, so there has to be a negative sign somewhere. And so in the way it's been written, there's my negative of six minus x. So I write, could write that as negative x. Um, oops, minus x, couldn't I? I could write it that way, which is this last factor. All right, so C is the correct response. And K is equal to, again, you could easily do this on the calculator, lads, and that's how I would probably recommend you do it. I'm surprised I didn't do a snap screenshot of that. Um, so on your CAS, substitute negative K in there, and you'll end up with this expression here. All right. So just be careful when you type it into your CAS, you've got 3x to the 4 plus 4x cubed minus 2k squared times x squared. Don't leave them together. All right. And then put, then put x equal to negative k. All right. Um, you get two answers at 0 and 4, but k doesn't include 0. So that's that one. The graph of the function f has adjacent asymptotes at negative 3 and pi on 3. Okay, so there's my asymptotes. The distance between the two is the period. So the period is 2 pi on 3. Um, so if pi on n is equal to 2 pi on 3, I can sort of flip them both upside down if you like. And then multiply the pi across. And we get 3 on 2 for n. So that's the only one we can have. Makes it easy. D. There's two real solutions. So again, it's a discriminant question, isn't it? All right. So again, you probably need get your discriminant. Um, so you're going to need to do that part and then solve it on your CAS. All right. We've, we really do want to solve. So if I solve p minus 2 all squared minus 4 greater than, greater than, yep, it's got to be greater than 0. The calculator will spit out an answer for me. All right. Simultaneous linear equations, mx plus ky have no solutions for. So again, this is one where I've um, decided to use the CAS. If we were doing it tech free, we would get y equals, wouldn't we? We do uh, y equals k minus x on m, y equals 4 minus m plus 3x on 4, and compare the gradients. If I just solve it instead, I end up with this expression, and that's the key expression. So when that's equal to 0, that's when I'm either going to have a parallel line or infinite line. All right. So we're looking for no solutions, which means I want parallel lines. So if I check, if I just initially pick m equal to 1, if I put m equal to 1 in both of these equations, I get x plus y is equal to k and 4y plus 4y, sorry, 4y plus 4x is equal to 4, which is the same as x plus y is equal to 1. So if I have m equal to 1, k equal to 1, I'm going to have an identical line. So if k doesn't equal 1, I will get a parallel line. All right, so c is m is equal to 1 and k not equal to 1. So k doesn't have to be negative 4, it can be anything, but that combination just happens to be a combination that will give me a parallel line. All right, so c is a response there. And once I get one of them correct, if I tried m equal to 1, I couldn't come up with a, a parallel line, well, then I'd have to check m equal to negative 4. Transformations that map the rule of negative 1 on 3x minus 1 minus 2 onto the graph of 1 on x. So this is where we've got the complicated function onto the basic function. So rearrange my complicated function. 
this is the original graph, y plus 2 over negative 1 equals 1 over 3x minus 1. And I'm going to equate that to the, I guess, almost in red, y equals 1 on x. That's my new function, my y dashes. So if you like, my y dash has to equal the left-hand side there in black now. And my x dashed is equal to 3x minus 1. And because I've trans, um, transformed into complicated to basic, I've already got my x dash y dashed equals. So x dashed is equal to 3x minus 1. And y dashed is equal to negative y minus 2. All right, and that matches off to one of them, I hope. B. Last couple. Function rule with the rule of half sine AX has a maximal domain and the alpha is not equal to zero. The graph of F is in order dilated by a factor of two from the X axis. So two from the X dilated by a factor of alpha from the Y. So let's start with Y is equal to a half sine AX. If I dilate in red by a factor of two from the X, that means from the X axis, I multiply the whole function by two, which leads me, that's my new rule now, sine AX. Dilate by a factor of A from the Y, which is the same as F of X on A, which cancels out the A's, which now leaves me with sine X. Translate one down and pi on two units left. Gives me a plus two minus one. So there's my new function. One of the x-intercepts of the transformed graph is located at, okay, so if that's sine x plus a half minus one, um, I need to solve x plus pi on 2, sine of that, and we can do that on our CAS. Here we go. We'll do it on our CAS. Sine of x plus pi on 2 minus 1 equal to 0. I get x is equal to some 2n pi. That's my general solution. So the only one, 2n pi means an even number, even whole number times pi. So the only one that satisfies that is that. Okay, because don't forget n is an element of z, which is a, an integer value. All right. So B must be the only possibility. Consider the polynomial, which of the following is false? So we're checking a whole lot of factors and remainders here. So I thought the easiest way is to find the function P of X and then just substitute everything in. And the only one that doesn't work out to be the answer we want is D. Yeah? x plus 2a is a factor, which means p of negative 2a should equal 0, and it doesn't. All right. The graph of those two intersect at two distinct points. So again, put the new piece back in. Um, if I solve a minus kx squared equal to 1 on x for x, I get this solution. Now, I need two possible answers, which means to get two possible answers, this expression in here has to be greater than zero. Because if it's equal to zero, my answers will be x is equal to a over 2k squared. That's if a squared minus 4k squared is equal to zero. I only get one solution. If it's negative, I get no solutions. So if I solve this expression, to be greater than zero. Um, and I've got a restriction on A because A is less than zero in the question. And if you don't put that in, you'll get a different case printout. You get that. Okay, which matches off to C. I should have done a snapshot. If you leave, if you don't put the A less than zero in, you'll get a slightly different answer, which will lead to one of these other things. All right. I think last multiple choice function if he's obtained from the graph of the rule g of x where a, b are a 
by reflection in the y-axis followed by a translation of one unit. Which of the following is a possible rule for x? So, we translate the rule. So I've got the function f is obtained from the graph of this function, good. So a reflection in the y-axis is negative x. A translation of one unit parallel to the x and a dilation of a units away from the y. So I've also got to multiply that by a, don't I? And the y value doesn't change. So that's what x dash y dash is equal to. So as we see there, x dash is equal to a minus x plus 1, y dash is simply equal to y, so x dash on a um, minus 1 is equal to negative x, so let's put x equals 1 minus x dash on a. Um, I guess if we, and then, so that's my x is equal to, y is equal to the same, substitute that into the rule. So I'll get y is equal to square root of b plus a times 1 minus x dash on a. Oops. So if we multiply the a through, I get a, the a's cancel there, minus x. Um, so that's a possibility of my new function, all right, um, which is A. Oh, two more. Several students were considering the function, looks similar. Alan stated the maximal domain is D except for A, which seems reasonable, and that the function has no turning points, as is a one-to-one -one function. Ben stated the graph crosses the x axis at b on a and thing o and y equals b on a. Common state of the graph has vertical asymptote at all right. We have so we have to find asymptotes, domain, and um, intercepts, don't we? So if I put that function in a right proper fraction, it does a division for me. Alright? So from here we know, let's get a highlighter. So what do we know about the asymptotes? The asymptotes are at negative a and negative a, so that's correct. So common is correct. Solve that function equal to zero, I get x equal to b on a, which is good. Uh, substitute zero into the function, I also then get b on a, so my x and y intercepts are b on a which is been correct. And actually I could have done the function, I should have done that as well, I didn't think of it, undo. But on your CAS, go to the catalog, you can type in domain. If I put domain B minus A X over X plus A comma X, it will say X is an element of R excluding negative A. It will spit that out for you on the case. So you can actually show that all three of the boys were correct. All right. Um, so E is correct option. Okay. Finally, the period and range of a function f are given by, so we've got the tan graph and the sine graph. So if, let's have it, so the periods, let's think about the period tan and sine. Okay, so we know that 4 on P will equal pi on N. Therefore, N will equal pi P on 4. And for sine, 4 on P will equal 2 pi on N. So N will equal 2 pi P on 4, which is equal to pi P on 2. So... 
and pi on 4. So neither of those can be right because n is equal to n pi on 4. If for sine we get n pi pi p on 2, that's the only one it can be. So I don't even have to worry about considering what the range is, but let's consider the range. Um, so for this graph here, okay, the normal sine graph would have the range of that graph would be negative b to b, wouldn't it? If I'm going to add c units to it, it'll be negative b plus c to b plus c. Okay, which is what we've been given up here at the top of the question. All right, so d is definitely correct. All right, so we've got a graph here that we're not overly familiar with, so we've got it onto our case there. A is the least possible V such that the inverse exists. Okay, so a lot of this is about do you know your facts? We need it to be one to one, which means they have one half or the other. Yeah? Now, since I'm going from A to positive infinity, I'm going to go from zero to positive infinity. So A has to be zero. Absolutely, we could have had that as a possible domain, negative infinity to zero, but we're taking the positive section. So that's the section that I've got. Find the rule and domain of the inverse. So I've just decided to identify a few things. The range of f is from zero to one. So we know that that's a domain of the new function. X is equal to one over y squared plus one, rearrange. So again, you can think to, if you want to, you can multiply y squared plus one across, and then that would be equal to one, and then divide the x back. Subtract one, take a positive square root. Uh, sorry, take a square root, don't forget plus or minus. All right, then you need to decide whether you want the positive or the negative, all right? So in this case, positives work out, don't they? Because the range of this function is from zero to one, and the domain is from also zero to one. So the range of my inverse is zero to one is positive value, so I want a positive. I want a positive square root of one over x minus one, and I'm gonna change the function to f inverse of x. That will cost you a mark if you don't do it, all right? But also wanted the domain, and we've got our domain of zero to one. Okay, um, the graph of f is dilated by all of these things to become the graph of h. Show that the rule is, okay. So here's my series of transformations. Dilate by a factor of three from the x, which means the y value gets multiplied. A half from the y, x value gets multiplied, reflect in the y axis, negative in front of the x. So there's my x dash equals y dash equals. So rearrange, you get x equals negative two x, y equals one third of y. Substitute those values in. Uh, okay, so we multiply by the three across. Three comes up here. Remembering that that vinculum, the line there, four x squared plus one is completely under. Um, so there's my new y function. And it's a rule for h of x, so h of x is equal to, we should probably get a little bit clearer, 4x squared plus 1. Find the domain of h. So to consider the domain of h, the domain of h, so h occurs after we apply all these transformations to f. So the domain of f is 0 to infinity. So if I go through and do my transformations to that domain, so dilate by a factor of three from the x axis. That what does that do? That affects the y values. So after the first transformation, what's going on here? After the first trans transformation, let's come back. The domain is still zero to infinity. Dilate by a half from the y, so all my x values get multiplied by a half. So that's still zero, and if you like, it would be half infinity, which is the same as infinity. You can't do anything to infinity, so the domain hasn't changed there. But then we reflect in the y axis, which means all my x values get hit by a negative one. 
So now my domain changes to negative infinity. Oh, geez, round bracket. Negative infinity to zero. Okay, that's how the domain becomes negative. So I've got this rule here: three over four x squared plus one. Uh, defined over negative infinity to zero. Go to the next question. Three over four x squared plus one defined over negative infinity to zero. So graphically, okay, gets the graphs of h and its inverse function h inverse. All right, so on your CAS, pop it in. You get your blue function there for h of x. Um, Yeah, and over negative infinity to zero, so that's it in blue. So we know that the inverse function, I can work out the rule again, um, but we know it's a reflection about the line y equals x. So if, if the original goes through zero, three, the new one goes through three, zero. Um, if the original approaches negative infinity along the x axis, the new one approaches negative infinity on the y axis, and then just pick a point. That looks like the coordinate, it's close to the point negative one, one. So this goes through the point one, negative one. And so hopefully you get a feel for what that function would be. Uh, clearly label any endpoints with their coordinates. So we've done that. Three, zero. And we've got zero, three there. Equation of any asymptote. So y equals zero for one, x equals zero to the other. All right. Use the fact that h of h inverse of x is equal to x, find the rule for. This is a bit tricky one, this one. It's not something we do often, but we do substitute composite functions. So they're saying if I substitute h inverse of x into the function h of x, I should get x as an answer, which is what that says there. So sub actually physically substitute h inverse of x as it's written in green into the function yeah so instead of 4x squared plus 1 i've got 4h inverse of x 4 squared plus 1 or under 3. so i can sort of flip them both upside down if i like um equal to x so here what have i done i've divided the x across Brought the four x. Sorry, that's a bit misleading. Multiplied that term, multiplied this whole term up to here, and then divide x back. All right. Subtract the one first, then divide by four. So I get that. Just to make life a little bit tidier, I decided to write that as three minus x. So three on x minus x on x. Get a common denominator, three minus x on x, just to tidy up a fraction, all right? And then on the next bit here, I've got four on the left-hand side, divide both sides by four. So I get my three minus x over four x. Take a square root, plus or minus. Think about your inverse function. Where's the inverse function? It's down here in the fourth quadrant where everything is negative. So I'm gonna need the negative sign out the front. Find the rule for h inverse, so h inverse of x written equals, okay? So it's just a different way we can find the inverse function. All right, question two, we've got a bit of a trig. Question, first step first is to put everything out, define the function on your CAS. Define f1 of x equals, 4 plus x on 5 plus sine pi x on 5. Define it. Uh, have a look at the window between negative 5 and 5. So do your window settings. I'm going to suggest negative 6 to 6 just so we can see everything. Um, the maximum values, well, I know sine has a maximum of 1. I've got a 4 there. So you would think... I don't know, negative 10 to 10 would be enough for the y values, okay? Just so we can see this section of the graph, all right? Write down the coordinates of the points A and B. 
Well, the x value there is negative 5. The x value there is positive 5. So substitute those into the function and you'll get 3 and 5. The coordinates of a and b. So that's how I know. If you just write down negative 5, 3, 5, 5, I reckon at best that's half a mark. Which one's which? I don't know. Okay, you haven't told me. So you've got to be really careful to make sure you specifically give the answer to the question being asked, okay? Find the coordinates of the northernmost points of the swimming pool, giving your answer. So you can trace it on your graph, three decimal places. You could use the rule function max or graph trace. Yeah. Now function max gives you the x value that you require, then you substitute that in to get the y value that you need. All right. We needed a coordinate to three decimal places. The swimming pool has a straight line segment joining C and D. Write down the function g of x, which defines this straight line. So there's our straight line up here. So you can see here I've filled in the coordinates already. To work out the equation of a straight line, I need two points that the line goes through. So we do know that from A down to D is a straight line. So we know the X coordinate is five units down because the total distance was 10. So negative five plus, oh, well, negative, sorry, five units up. What was that Y coordinate? Sorry, that's three there, that's five there. So three up here, go down 10 units. Seven units, I should read the question properly. Go down seven units, so three minus seven is negative four. Five minus seven is negative two. So now that's how I get the coordinates for D and C, okay? Negative five, four, five, negative two, and we work out the equation of a straight line. We work out the gradient, y2 minus y1. So hopefully we remember all that stuff. Um, gives me one fifth. Substitute any point into y equals mx plus c, I'll get c equal to negative three. So does one fifth of x minus three seem reasonable? Well, negative three there seems pretty fair. So I'm, I'm comfortable with that answer. All right, cool. So if we go back to our pool, the maximum and minimum width look like they're kind of around there. We want the maximum and minimum values in units. Hey, what happened? Find the maximum and minimum widths measured north and south in the swimming pool. Again, a little bit smidgen outside of our course, but the first part of it isn't. The top of the line, top function is given by f of x. The bottom function is given by g of x. So if I work out f of x minus g of x, I get that as a rule. Yeah, And so that works out really quite nicely because the maximum value of sine pi x on 5 plus 7 is 8. The minimum value is 7 minus 1, which is 6, because the maximum of that is well, negative one to one are the extreme values. Find the maximum and minimum width. So it didn't ask us where they were. So clearly say maximum eight, minimum six, and we're away. So that's one mark each. You probably needed to either have this rule or some statement like that for the third mark. All right, question three, a little bit outside the course just yet, but once we get our turning points, we're back in. We're back in play. So if you use your CAS, solve the derivative equal to... Okay, well, let's... A couple of things. Increasing function means f dash of x is greater than zero. Okay, so let's find the turning points. Um, and so on your CAS over here, that's how we get our turning points from. If you hopefully you can remember that from last year. If you can't, that's okay. So this this part of it isn't really going to be on it. All right. So if I find the derivative, I get those two points. Um, if I substitute down here, just underneath the graph, substitute those points into the function rule, I'll get the y values. 
So this is where it becomes now fair game again. So now that you've got these two points, okay, um, we know that maximum coordinate there, and we know this minimum coordinate there, okay? So we will work out increasing function means gradient is positive. So hopefully you've worked out where the gradient is positive is all the way through here, but not including that point, all the way through here, but not including that point, which is what this says here, okay? Now state the transformation which maps the graph of y equals f of x onto the graph of y equals g of x. So how do I turn f of x into g of x? I just shift it up d units. Nothing special about that. Now, find the values. Um, cross the x-axis only once. Okay, find the values of d in terms of a such that the graph has, okay, the x crosses the x-axis only once, which means this is what the graph needs to look like, one of these two versions, all right? So to make it look like the green version, come over here to the graph, I've got to move this down to there. So it's that y value is the magic value, isn't it? Now it looks complicated, but pretend that that y value is two. And if that y value was two, you would know you would need to shift the graph down two units. So instead, I need to shift it down to a cubed root three on three units. Okay, similarly, if I want to get the second alternative on the graph over here on the right, I want to shift it up that many units with the negative there. All right. Um, again, if that was negative two, I'd want to shift it up at least two units. So I need to shift it up at least two a cubed root three on nine units. So that gives me those two versions of the graph, which means I would only have one x intercept. Um, if I want to keep across the axis three times, I want to keep pretty much what I've got, three x intercepts. So I've got to move it in between those values, but not including those values. Because again, if I move it exactly one of those values, I'm going to have a turning point there on the axis, which means I've only got two intercepts. All right. So parts B. Part B is um, not a part of the course, but if we were to, oh, sorry, not part of the course, not a part of what we've covered so far, but if we were to give you that graph, if we were to give you a graph here that looked like this, and we called that negative one, three, and called that one, negative two, we would expect you to be able to then do part C, D, C and D. Okay, in terms of shifting the graph up and down, or in fact, shifting it left and right. Okay, maybe that's negative two, zero, one. Shift it right so that there's only one positive intercept, or that there's two negative intercepts, or something like that. Okay. All right. Victoria James is a spy, and she's got herself a submarine. Uh, she is trapped in a stationary mini submarine that is being fired on by an enemy ship. The ship is firing dolphin missiles. Follow the curve. Uh, vertical distance missile above the water or below the water if it's negative. Okay. What is the maximum distance below the surface of the water that a dolphin missile can reach? Well, three, isn't it? So negative three to three is the range of that function. So three meters below. Okay. Um, Negative three meters, massive question mark, because below already suggests that it's negative. So again, I think just state what it is clearly, concisely, it makes life a bit easier. The enemy ship is stationary and is located at a point zero zero. Victoria is located two kilometers away, there she is, at the point two zero. The graph below shows the path of first missile. The first missile entered the water for the second time at a point that was 0.2 kilometers short of Victoria's position. So it enters the water, but so we're assuming um, 
uh, this discussion. So assuming that at this point here, it, it's not an anything. Okay, so it's if anything, you could argue that it's leaving the water for the first time. Um, so first entry point, second entry point. All right. Show that this first mile alpha is equal to 5.3. So at that point there, what have we got? We've got one period to here, and then I've got another half period to 1.8. Okay, so one and a half periods is 1.8, which means three on two times the period is 1.8. So the period is equal to 1.2 kilometers, which is six on five. All right. So now I know that the period two pi on n is equal to six on five. Rearrange for n, I get two pi divided by six on five, which means it's two pi times five on six, which gives me five pi on three. So that's what the period n value is going to be. Um, the n value in this case is pi a. So if pi a is equal to five pi on three, a is equal to five on three. All right. Now, find the acute angle between the horizontal and tangential tangent to the part that first moves from the water. Give your answer in degrees correct to two decimal places. This is not a part of the course at the moment, lads. You may possibly remember that m is equal to tan theta, okay, where m is the gradient. All right. So in reality, what we're doing is we're saying that where it exits the water, so the point at that line, the gradient of that line, m is equal to tan theta, which is equal to the derivative at that point, okay, which is um, 1.2, I think. So look, we'll worry about that when we get to calculus. All right. Enters the water for the second time, which means the one and a half. We're just going to go slightly further. Bang. Okay. Uh, what's the next bit? Further missiles are fired. Find the values of A if a missile was to hit Victoria submarine as the missile entered the water for the second time. So what does that mean? And so that means the one and a half periods has to equal 2.0. So if we go through all the same mathematics, this time A will need to equal three on two. Find the values of A for which a missile will pass over Victoria submarine at 2.0 before hitting the water for the first time. So it's got to pass over her. So there she is there. So the missile's got to be Greater, so half the period has got to be greater than two, doesn't it? Um, so p has got to be greater than half of p has got to be greater than two, so p has got to be greater than four. The period has got to be greater than four, which means two pi and n has got to be greater than four. Do some rearranging, and we'll get a has to be less than a half. All right, nearly there, lads. Victoria leaves the mini submarine and swims to the enemy ship. Stationary, she reaches a bomb immediately before it starts moving a straight line away from the ship. Victoria's speed and kilometers per hour she swims is given by. So that's the speed she's traveling at. Where X is Victoria's horizontal distance in kilometers from the ship. Show that K is equal to one. So at the point, that's what it says here. At X equal to two, the speed is equal to two. So if I substitute two zero on both, scenarios i've got to show it so i can't leave any bits of math out notice i've got all the math in there um i can't just say s of two is equal to two i can't put k equal to one and show that it's true so go through all the math k can equal one or negative five but k is positive okay so show all the working on any sort of a show statement. What's D mean? Oh, D is the domain. Which is... Find the values of D, give your answer correct to two decimal places. G 
you stop swimming? So stop swimming at the S of X equal to zero. So they're the possible values over here to find the function D. Solve F of X equal to zero, I get negative one, zero, or 3.2. So given that these are the values of the domain, negative one and zero are outside the scope of what we want to accept. So 3.26 is the only possible answer um, for the domain. Find Victoria's distance from the ship when her speed is a maximum. So again, you can use the term function max, a smidgen calculus sort of, but if I do function max on, again, over on the right, function max of that function, I get 2.212. And find the maximum speed, well, it's going to be the Y value at that point, which is 2.0506. Make sure you put the correct number of decimal places. Finally, she must detonate the bomb whilst swimming. To do so, she must be swimming at 1.5 kilometres an hour or slower and must be at least three kilometres from the enemy ship. Find the exact values of X which Victoria can detonate the bomb. So initially, um, I want to find out where she is three kilometres away. Okay, so if X is equal to three, so this, it's this section in here on the graph on the right. That's where we want to be. So at x equal to 3, that's the point 3, 1. So her speed at that point is 1 kilometre per hour. So she's slow enough to detonate the bomb. And clearly, it's going to be continue to be slow enough as she travels on further. So she finally comes to a rest at 3.26 metres or kilometres, kilometres, um, which is what we found in part G. So for X is equal to three in black here, for X is equal to three to 3.26, she is far enough away and also slow enough. But at 3.26, that's when she stops swimming. But in the question, she says she has to be swimming. So it's a little bit... Is treading is not swimming the same as swimming at less than 1.5 kilometers an hour? Apparently not. Okay, so you've got to be swimming. However, so there has to be some motion. So that means she can be between three to 3.26, not inclusive of that endpoint, um, to detonate the bomb. All right. So I thought this last bracket here was, yeah, a little bit pedantic, I think. All right, so with that, there were a few elements here that are not really part yet, the calculus in particular, but there's a lot of it still is. Final question, we've got a viral infection that causes flu-like symptoms, a virus is contagious, can spread from person to person. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? So the number of new cases, new BK cases, and after T days is given by. After two days, 1,600 people, previously unexposed to the virus will have BK, show that A is equal to 5,600. Again, it's a show. So T equal to 2, M is equal to 1,600. You've got to substitute all that in. 1,600, T is equal to 2, and then rearrange and solve and show 5,600, okay? The number of new cases, T days after, in an isolation where people previously exposed to the virus, they've got immunity. Bt over t plus 2, between 0 and 10, where t is a positive constant. After five days, 2,000 people previously exposed the virus will have BK. So it's exactly the same thing, isn't it? t is equal to 5, is n, n is equal to 2,000. Don't leave any gaps in the working out. All right? The difference in the new cases between these previous exposures and exposures is given by, bang. Show that the value of c is 2,800. So this is going to take some algebra. M of T minus N of T is the difference. So there's my two rules. Again, because it's a show, I can't take any shortcuts. You can expand things on your CAS to help you get, like from this top line here to this line here, you could expand it on your CAS and just help you to not make mistakes. 
Um, and despite as messy and as ugly as you think it seems to be, our 5,600 T squares cancel, 112 or 11,200, 8,400, the difference of there is 2,800. We sort of, we cross multiplied in here to begin with. Um, and it actually isn't too bad. It's just getting used to working with, I guess, expressions um, with pronumerals in there. All right. And, okay, so this is all now purely calculus. But we've got a rule. Um, you know, what's the difference in your case between? So for those of you that had a go, um, this, uh, a rate is my derivative, so d dash of t. Um, so that's just straight off the CAS, type it in. Maximum difference in the new cases. Um, so again, the maximum difference, so we'd have to solve d dash of t equal to zero. Um, which probably occurs at t equal to plus or minus root three. And yeah, positive root three. And then you end up with approximately 20. But again, not for this. Okay, done.